Good afternoon, I'm Jen Maxey. I'm the Director of Public Programs here at the Holocaust Museum, LA. This is Modern Maccabees, 80 years after the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. And this is our concluding program in a riveting series this week with Yad Vashem's Rabbi Moshe Cohen. So thank you, Rabbi, for just an incredible series of talks. And of course, thank you to Yad Vashem. Mm -hmm. So in the fall of 1940, the Nazis established a ghetto in Warsaw, Poland, largest, uh, Pol Poland's largest city with the largest Jewish population, 375,000. Microphone. Almost 30% of Warsaw's population was packed into 2.4% of the city's area. The Jews of Warsaw were cut off from the outside world. Forced starvation, cramped living, and rampant disease led to mass death. On April 19, 1943, <coughs> on the eve of Passover, 700 Jewish fighters rose up in armed revolt after rumors that the Germans would deport the remaining ghetto inhabitants to the Triplinka Killing Center. These brave, underarmed, unsupported fighters were able to hold off the German forces for 27 days after which the Nazis burned the ghetto to the ground and deported all the remaining Jews to be murdered. But word of the ghetto fighters' heroic last stand spread, inspiring hope and opposition to Nazi forces. Today, as we approach the 80th anniversary of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, the continued importance of standing up together against the alarming rise in anti-Semitism remains crucial. Holocaust Museum LA is at the forefront of teaching students and the public the critical lessons and continued social relevance of the Holocaust, empowering visitors to stand up and speak out against hatred, bigotry, and anti-Semitism. So I see a lot of familiar faces. Some of you were at the talk this morning. But for those of you who have not visited us, do we have anyone here visiting us for the first time? Oh, wonderful. Mm -hmm. I'd love to see that. So. If you haven't visited us, let me just tell you, Holocaust Museum LA is the first survivor founded and the oldest Holocaust Museum in the country. We are home to the West Coast's largest collection of Holocaust era artifacts. Admission is free for students and for youth under 17, and that's always. In addition to free admission, we offer transportation grants for schools where field trips would otherwise be cost prohibitive. We offer customized tours, artifact-rich and high-tech exhibits, creative educational programs, and intergenerational conversations with Holocaust survivors. Do we have any survivors with us today? Not this afternoon, okay. Our student programs are truly making an impact on behaviors. Students come in as bystanders, and they leave as upstanders. Since opening our permanent home in Pan Pacific Park in 2010, we've welcomed nearly 600,000 visitors. To meet the need and demand for Holocaust education, we launched our Building Truth expansion plan to double the museum's footprint without losing any green space in the park. And if you haven't seen it, there is a monitor downstairs that will show you the 3D of the expansion. And we're soon going to break ground on that. This will be the new Jonah Goldrich campus. It will allow us to keep survivor voices alive, amplify our reach and impact, and increase our visibility. So, without further ado, it is really my privilege today, and you are in for a treat, to introduce Rabbi Moshe Cohen. He is the head of the Jewish World Section, International Seminars and Jewish World De Department, and the International School for Holocaust Studies at Yad Vashem in Jerusalem. Rabbi, thank you. Thank you, everyone, and thank you very much to the L.A. Uh, Holocaust Museum. They're wonderful people. They've treated me like a king, and uh, it's been a pleasure, my time here. Today we're going to do something a little different. I'm going to give you context, but the story of the ghetto we're only going to hear through the voice of, of witnesses and people who participated, because there's nothing I can say that makes a difference. You know, it's, a, it's an emotional topic, especially for people from that generation. Uh, I'll tell you a related story. When I was a little kid, so it was the 1967 war. My father was a survivor. We lived in Minnesota, and uh, he was a survivor. And what did all survivors thought the same thing in 1967, right? All these countries were attacking Israel. It's over. This is it. What Hitler didn't finish, now it's going to be taken care of. And they were beside themselves. And he went out to raise money. That's all they could do in Minnesota. 
That's all they could do. So I was a kid, I went to bed, and he was out all night. And one day he came in, at the end of the, that night he came in, he came right into my room, I guess, and he woke me up. And he's crying and crying, and he says, we're fighting back. Mm -hmm. We're fighting back. Mm -hmm. We have to understand the moment in time of the Warsaw Ghetto. And then we can better understand what was going on. So let's, let's do a little history. Now the history, like all history, might be a touch dry. Don't worry, it won't be terrible. It'll be just a touch dry, but I want you to know it so you can appreciate it. We'll start with Franklin D. Roosevelt, a good Israeli kid. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Nice Jewish boy who made good. <laughs> Courage is not the absence of fear, but rather the assessment that something else is more important than fear. The alternative is worse than the fear. Mm -hmm. So you do what you have to do. That's very much. The, 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 the people who fought in the Warsaw Ghetto didn't do it for kicks. They did it because there was something more important. Many Jewish youth organizations came into being in Europe between the two world wars. These movements had different motivations, whether religious, social, cultural, or political. Some were communist or socialist, others were Zionist, and some movements were both Zionist and socialist. Others were not associated with any political movement or ideology. However, as the Nazis began persecuting Jews throughout Europe, members of all the Jewish youth movements took a leading role in resisting the Nazis and assisting their fellow Jews. It's less today. Today, youth groups are less than they were. But when I was a kid already, was still everybody was part of a youth group, some youth group, because it was a place to dream and make your dreams come true. What were some of the youth groups that existed in between the wars? Well, there was a lot of them. Now, this is only a fraction. Hashomer Hatzair, right, was radical Zionists and socialists. What does that mean? Everybody should live in Israel no matter what. And socialists, let's share. Share and share alike. Of course, these, the members of Hashem Eretzim, tended to come from wealthy families. So it's a little easier to be socialist when, you know, you're rich. Right? It's a little easier. But then, if you weren't so fabrent, right, like like Shomer uh, Tzayir, there was Gadonia, which was also Zionist, but Zionists also mean could be supporting Israel. Not everyone could live there right away. You make a home, but you should support Israel. And they were financially less significant than our Shomerits are here. Beitar, Zionist revisionists, Jabotinsky and Menachem Begin, they were already radicals. They were ready to fight, right? They, they simply were tit for tat, eye for eye, right? And they were going to create a Jewish state because we deserve a Jewish state. My dad was a member of Jabotinsky. Of, of Beitar. And today, too, they exist, and they're a more militant group, right? Uh, Drawer, Zionist, socialist, but their members were less affluent than most Hashomer and Tzair. Again, you, you, you lived within, what? I'm just going to move this way a little bit. Oh, you lived within your means. So they were a Zionist group that was even less affluent than Hashomer and Tzair and Hanoa Hatzioni were Hebrew culture. They believed in living in Israel, but they also believed very much not in Jewish religion per se, but in Hebrew culture, right? In uh, in singing and dancing and 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 creating uh, moments of significance, right? If you've read Frankel, you understand the importance of of creating moments of value. And Akiva was Zionist in Hebrew culture also. This is an example of six, there are many, many others. There was B'nai Akiva, there was the Aguda, there was religious groups all over. These are, are six that were very, very prominent in Warsaw before the war. Many of the Zionist movements were connected to specific kibbutz movements in Palestine, right? So you had different kibbutzim in Israel, and they had corresponding youth groups in Europe. And part of their ideology was to send members off to settle in Palestine. They would go in Europe to like camps in the summer where they would learn art, agriculture, they would learn how to work the field, they would rough it, they would sleep on the ground, they would you know, gather around the, the, uh, the fire, and they liked it. And then they would go from there to Israel. They were called Chalutzim. They were the first guys who roughed it in Israel, right? Not like me. When I went to Israel already, I indoor plumbing. Right, we got a phone right away. Right, I, I was able to buy a car. Right, even had air conditioning. I'm talking about guys who went and 
didn't have any of those modern affectations of life. Right? The connection between members of youth movements was very strong, as was their belief that they were preparing for was very worthwhile and important. The attitude is probably one of the greatest reasons why during the war, youth movement members, despite their age, took a leading role in resisting the Nazis. Now, I want there's going to be, I'll tell you a little bit now, but you'll hear it in one of the testimonies. There's a woman, you'll hear a testimony, she, her job was to put up posters in the Warsaw Ghetto, announcing that there's going to be an action, right? The, the, the youth group movements are going to fight. So the guy you're interviewing says, you know, it's very dangerous, why'd you do it? So she said, it was fun. It was fun. There is part of it. Part of it. They were young, idealistic, and young people have both a blessing and a curse. They don't know that life is ever going to end. Right? The young people are eternal. They, they, they're optimistic and they simply don't know that you could fall down and hurt yourself. They don't care. So that, that's maybe one of the reasons they're going to be so important in this story. Right before World War II broke out in the fall of 39, some 100,000 young Jews were involved in the various youth movements. Even though the Nazis outlawed Jewish youth movements and their activities early on, the movements continued to be in secret. The Nazis created the largest youth movement of the time. They had millions of German youth in, in, in the Junge Mädelach for women and the uh, uh, Hitler Youth for Boys, and at one point it was the largest youth group in the world. Jews, of course, were excluded, so they couldn't go camping, they couldn't be part of all the activities in school, they didn't wear the uniform, so they had their own alternative, albeit underground alternative. After Germany invaded Poland, signaling the beginning of the war in 1939, many youth movements, leaders fled the cities of Western and Central Poland for Soviet-held Eastern Poland hoping to make it to Palestine. Why did they run to Soviet Eastern Poland? Why did they run to the Soviet Union? No, but they didn't care about the pact. The Soviets were the good guys. Why? Because they were socialists. Share and share alike. You gotta, don't think about it now. Think about it then. The idea that everyone would share everything. That there was no classes. There were no more kings. There were no more queens. Everybody had a right, and the Soviet Union was the dream. So these young Jewish socialists, that's what they wanted. They had been beaten up. They grew up in, a, in tremendous anti-Semitism, and they dreamed of a place where they could be not only equal, but the same as everyone else. There was no discriminating between rich and poor. There was no, and that's what a kibbutz was. Kibbutz was communism in its purest form. How, until what extent children were born in the kibbutz and they were raised by the kibbutz, not by the parents. They were put in a communal house and there was women who took turns and they raised the children and, and, and then you visited your parents the way you visited other people. But it wasn't a family unit the way we think about it. Ultimately today it's not really like that anymore, but that's what it was and that's why they ran to the Soviet. Yeah? I just want to say my father... Um, in, in, the, in the fall when the Germans invaded in 39, took his two very young um, in-laws, uh, two brothers who were brothers to my mother, across Poland to the, to the Soviet border, and they ended, and my father returned to the family in Poland. Oh, so we're going to talk about your dad. And then, and then uh, they ended up... No, they ended up get contacted with the British and entering the British in Palestine and fighting for the British. Mm. Well, that's already a unique story. Mm. But they, they, they it's, it's a fairly common story. People, young youth group movements went east. They went to the, to the Soviet. Soon, however, some of the youth movements decided to send some of their seniors back to Germany. Now, this is a, a significant moment because they saw the communities under German rule were floundering and they needed the strength the attitude, the can-do point of view that these youth group leaders had, right? And they helped their fellow young people trapped by the Nazis and reorganized them for a viable existence as secret underground organization, right? Here they were smuggled, they, these guys smuggled food into the Warsaw Ghetto, right? We'll talk about that in a minute. 
what were some of the things the youth movements did, right? So, for example, in Kovno, they, had, they set up schools. And they taught the kids Hebrew. They taught the kids culture. They taught the kids some Judaism, right? Frumal Platnica was a member of Dror, the youth group that we saw before, and a resistance fighter. And she was killed in the Benzin ghetto. But what does that mean? She was, there was a group of women who transferred information from one ghetto to another. Nine out of ten times were youth group members. And the reason they were women is because when they were suspected and stopped by the Gestapo, by the Nazis, and told to drop their pants, so Jewish women look much more like non-Jewish women than Jewish boys necessarily look like non-Jewish boys. So for the Jewish boy, it could be a death sentence. But the woman, if she was smart and trained as they were, and they were usually exceedingly beautiful, they were able to get beyond that difficult moment. In the Warsaw ghetto, they set up a soup kitchen. What does that mean, a soup kitchen? Right? It means that they put a little salt in the water, and they shared with people who had less than nothing. They who had nothing shared with people who had less than nothing. It was very famous in Lodge. Lodge ghetto also, they, they did such things. And they, they, these type of activities gave a hope to the Jewish people as the weight of the Nazi oppression became heavier and heavier and heavier. Unlike many of the older, more established Jewish communal leaders who felt that this too shall pass, how do you deal with all this onslaught of anti-Semitism? So the older leaders said, we've done it before, we'll do it again. This is not the first time They've been anti-Semitic, we'll survive it. But the youth group leaders, they saw something was different here. They're the ones who coined the phrase, going to the slaughter, sheep to the slaughter. They saw with clarity that almost bordered on prophecy because there was no material they had to indicate the conclusions that they came to. They were convinced that they had no real chance of survival under the Nazis and that their only chance was armed resistance even until the death of their last man. Thus, after the final solution was put into effect, the youth movements began organizing themselves for resistance against the Nazis. Before World War II, Warsaw was the center of the Jewish population of Europe. Jews had lived there for over 500 years. By the eve of the war, fully 30% of the city was Jewish. In 1939, the Germans conquered Poland very quickly, and World War II began. <coughs> the Germans had planned to deport the Jews. However, the plans didn't immediately succeed. And so, as an interim measure, Jews were concentrated in cities and near railways, and these became <coughs> ghettos. The ghettos were not an end in and of themselves. They were interim measures, again, on the way to deportation and then later on to mass murder. Once the ghetto became a reality, the Jews trapped inside were its prisoners. They could no longer come and go freely as they wanted to. They literally went to bed one night and woke up the next morning surrounded by walls. And now at the entrance to the ghetto stood very intimidating symbols of authority, German guards and Polish policemen. Any Jew who was found outside the ghetto was unceremoniously shot. The Jews were sealed inside the ghetto. So, again, the important points to take away from this little clip was that the ghettos were set up by the Nazis not as an end unto themselves. So I said before that when you're talking about the Holocaust, there's an elephant in the room. And you have to look at the position in which you're standing. So here we see that there were two different perspectives that were going on as the Jews were being ghettoized. The first was the Nazis. The Nazis said, we don't know what to do with them yet. We have a problem. Their numbers are increasing from 350,000 when it was just the German Reich until in 1939, another, an additional 2.5 million. So the numbers were exploding and the Nazis didn't know what to do with them. So they began to put them in ghettos because they weren't easily disenfranchised from society. That was the Nazi perspective. The Jewish perspective, based on the leadership, not the youth group leadership, but the leadership of the adults was, look, it's a shame, it's horrendous that it's anti-Semitism is weird, but it's happened before. It's happened before, we survived it, we'll survive it again. So they were going into the ghetto, 
to try to figure out how to make a life, as difficult as that might be. So you had two distinct perspectives that resulted in two conclusions. Let's continue. Okay. You heard before there was 460,000 people at the height of the population in the uh, Let me show you what it looked like. Over 400,000 people, which was a 30% of Warsaw, in an area of, uh, that was fit for 3%. So it was A, crowded. What happens when things are crowded? Disease, Disease of course, but socially what happens? A breakdown of order. Yes. What? You have to share. Yeah, share what? Resources. Not only resources, space, but also information, right? Everyone's on top of each other. What's going on, right? It, 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 things were like wildfire in the ghetto. And any little rumor, they understood they couldn't stay like this. They couldn't stay in a population of 400,000 in, in, in three and a half miles of square of space. It couldn't be. It couldn't be. So they were worried what's going to be, what is going to be. What's going to happen to us? Where are we going to go? Right? Rumors spread like wildfire. At that time, the ghetto was in a high state of agitation, and they began to talk about something called the Grozhanowski Report. What was the Grozhanowski Report? It was from this guy, Zlama Ben Wiener. Zlama Ben Wiener was a fellow who was sent to Chelmno. Chelmno was the first death camp. There's different types of concentration camps. There was a, a, a gathering camp, there was a work camp, and then there was a death camp. Chelmno was the first death camp. It was famous for using uh, hermetically sealed wagons. They would pipe the exhaust back into the wagon, they'd drive people around until they were dead. And that was inefficient, and then better, more efficient methods were used in later death camps. But he was sent to Chalmna, and he escaped. And he ran to the Warsaw Ghetto, and he wrote a report under the pseudonym of Yako Grozhaneski. And he told them what was going on in Chalmna, right? And he wrote it as part of something called the Oinig Shabbos, which was headed by Emanuel Ringelblum. Emanuel Ringelblum recorded everything in the ghetto. Mm -hmm. The, re the reason we know the truth of what happened in the ghetto is because of his writings compared to, excuse me, movies and pictures taken by the Nazis. So we take a picture from the Nazis that has no information, and whatever information it has is from the Nazis. 
so we can't believe it. And we look for something describing what we see in the Ringelblum archives that were buried underneath the ghetto and found by Yad Vashem after the war. And we put them together to come up with an assemblance of truth. Right? So he wrote that the Nazis are liquidating people immediately. Death camps. It's, and the people went nuts. <coughs> Did you hear? 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 And they were petrified. They were frightened. Until it finally came an issue of official concern. The Jungrat, which was responsible for keeping order in the ghetto under the direction of a man named Adam Cherniak, Cherniatsko, Cherni, Cherni, said, we have to deal with this. So what happened? He, they began to go and see, is such a thing possible? So they went to a professor named Ignacy Schipper, who was a Zionist and a professor in Warsaw University. And they said, come on, is, is it possible that the Nazis are wiping out everybody and that we're just somewhere on a list? And he said, no. It's impossible to liquidate a population of a half a million people. It's not possible. The Germans will not dare annihilate the largest Jewish community in Europe. They will have to reckon with the world public opinion. And finally, there is the assurance of Governor General Frank that Warsaw, Radom, and Krakow will remain. So he based his logic to give false security to the Jews on three things. One is the numbers. The numbers alone make it unlikely. The second is the Nazis say they're not doing it. And Jews have, Jews have an unbelievable trust of authority. It's somehow in our genes. But they, they bought into it. They didn't know about concentration camps, per se. They knew this one story from a crazy guy. But they didn't know really what was going on. They don't know about Treblinka yet. They will soon. Right? And then, but more, the civilized world is never going to let it happen to us. Right? It's never going to let it happen to us. All three proved to be false. Which now... If you just put it in the back of your mind, it might help you understand some of the reasons why Israel makes the foreign relations decisions it does. Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, we're a little tiny bedraggled, nothing of a state, but we don't expect anyone to come to our defense. Mm -hmm. It's because of this. The trauma has not passed. Let us continue. The Great Deportation. Adam Chernyanko's diary. Right? What did he write? In the morning at 7 30, the Gestapo asked Sergeant Mende, right? I don't have a uh, here, Mende, right? How much truth there was to the rumors about deportation that were going to a death camp? He replied, he had heard nothing. I turned to Obenstone Führer Karl Brandt. He also knew nothing. I went to Deputy Chief Section Chair. I don't have a picture of him. He expressed his surprise at hearing the rumors and informed me that he too knew nothing about it. Now remember, Adam Trinieko was the head of the UNRWA. He had a relationship with these people. They would give him orders of what to do and he would administrate it, as difficult as that was. So he trusted them when he asked them a personal question. Finally, I asked whether I could inform the population that their fears were groundless. He said I could, and that all the talk was utter nonsense. I ordered Jacob Lakin, who was the head of the Jewish police, to make the public announcement. So that was on July 20th, 1942. What happened then? This is from the diary of Abraham <laughs> about the expulsion of Jews is spreading like lightning through the town. Jews run by in confusion, terrified. 
The Jewish streets are an appalling sight. The gloom is indescribable. On Zamenhof Street, the Germans pulled people out of a tram and killed them on the spot. The roundup was halted at three o'clock. The savagery of the police during the roundup, the murderous brutality. They dragged girls from the rickshaws, empty out flats, and leave the property strewn everywhere. How did Jews hide? In couches, in beds, cellars, attics. Six on the street, 99 victims. Today, 12,000 murders. The violence of the police, the breakup of families, Mendrovsky Polo. It hurts so much. Only the workers in the workshops seem to still be safe. A meeting of Oinik Shabbos. Its tragic character. They discuss the question of ownership and the transfer of the archive to America to the Yivo if we all die. It's a wonder that people can endure so much suffering living the whole day on a knife edge between life and death and clinging with all their might to life in the hope that they may be among the 10 survivors. Early this morning, the Germans and the rioters spread through the ghetto. In the course of five minutes, they drove out all the occupants on Genja Street between Zamanov and Lubyachka Streets. They pay no attention to papers. Eclipse of the sun. Universal blackness. My muba was taken away. I have no words to describe my desolation. I ought to go after her, to die, but I have no strength to take such a step. I will never be consoled as long as I live to fall into the hands of such butchers. How tragic it is. A life together of over 21 years has met such a tragic end. The side of the streets, the pavements are fenced off. You walk in the middle of the road. Certain streets are completely closed off with fences and gates, and you can't get in there. The impression is of cages. The home of Jewish Warsaw has been thrown out of the buildings. There's a full-scale relocation of all Jews who have not yet been rounded up and are still in the town. The pain because of the loss of Luba is becoming more intense. My soul can find no peace for not having gone after her when she was in danger. Even though I could have also disappeared, and Aura would have been left an orphan. There's talk of a second front in France and Holland. If these things had happened four or five weeks ago, perhaps we would have been saved from the catastrophe. Six in the evening. Jewish policemen have returned from the town and said that the action is continuing. So, all our hopes that the bloody action has ceased now have been swept away. How will we survive? How will we be able to bear it? People talk of the special danger that now threatens children. A terrible dread seizes me when I think of the fate of Aura. She has no documents and is in danger. Since Friday, no news reaches us from the other side of the wall. The terrible appearance of the streets, transformed into an Unschlagplatz. The crowds of Jews with packs in their backs streaming from the streets of the ghetto. Everyone is camped out on the street. The Svesha family has perished. He gave himself up after seeing how his wife and two children were taken. Initially, he went with us to Geisha Street. Later, he went back, gave himself up, and was sent away. I feel a great compassion and admiration for this straightforward person. We tremble at every noise and shot that comes from the street. 
Today is the 52nd day in the greatest and most terrible slaughter in history. We are the tiny remnants of the greatest Jewish community in the world. A Jew has returned to our workshop and worked as a grave digger in Jablinka. According to what he said, not only Jews from Warsaw and of the Gubernia are being exterminated in Treblinka, but Jews from all over Europe, from France, Belgium, Holland, among others. Those who are far away cannot imagine our bitter situation. They will not understand and will not believe that day after day, thousands of men, women, and children, innocent of any crime, were taken to their death. Almighty God, why did this happen? And why is the whole world deaf to our screams? How terrible it is that a whole generation, millions of Jews, has suddenly become a community of martyrs who have had to die in such a cruel, degrading, and painful manner and go through the torments of hell before going to the gallows. Earth, Earth, do not cover our blood and do not keep silent so that our blood will cry out until the ends of time and demand revenge for this crime that has no parallel in our history and in the whole of human history. That's the words of a father from the ghetto. Mm -hmm. Let's try to unpack his very, very powerful diary and make sense of it. July 22nd to the 30th, 65,000 Jews were taken from resettlement. This is only two days after Chernienko got a promise from the Nazis that this was not going to happen. Mm -hmm. So what happened? Realizing what was about to happen, he saw that they lied to him completely. He committed suicide on July 23rd, which was a big blow to the community because he, to the extent that anyone who was in his position was able to have a, a good reputation, a not good, but he was, he was respected by a significant number of Jews, and now that leadership was gone. So they felt that they had no one helping them, yes. How quickly did the community learn of his suicide? Everything happened with lightning speed there. It was be before there were internet, there was the Warsaw Ghetto. And 400,000 pedal. Yeah, it was, it was true. It, it mm. spread like wildfire. Mm -hmm. right? July 31st, August 1st, 20,000 Jews volunteered for 6.6 .6 kilo of bread and one kilo of jam. They were starving. So they, and they got it. They got the bread, they got the jam, and then they went to die. August, July 30, 31st to August 14th, German and Lithuanian soldiers and Jews were searched for and forcefully dragged off any Jews without papers. Still on August 14th, if you had papillon, so you could say, here, I'm valuable. I have a reason to live. If you didn't, they would take you right away. Okay? But already August 15th, papers were meaningless. Right? On September 6th to 21st, 1942, an intensive selection known as the Kessel, because everything was just mixed up and they, they pulled people out of the cauldron. Right? In a space of 60 days, almost 300,000 Jews were sent to their deaths in Trevita. There was approximately 60,000 Jews left in the ghetto. What did those 60,000 Jews think? So when the people were going, being resettled, quote unquote, to the east, I once came home for lunch and found my parents beside themselves, uh, unrecognizable, really. And uh, my father said, we have something to tell you. Actually, we have to tell you two things, because your mother and I have different stories. So let your mother speak first. And my mother just said, took some box and says, Henry, these are poison pills. If you are caught by Germans, take them immediately. Mm. Remember, we're mm. hearing now the response to the 
great service. The message was, don't believe the Germans. If you can, you have to hide. If you can, you have to escape. You have to run. If you want to to, to try to, to, to save your life, because there is no life beyond Treblinka. At that meeting, we started doing the same what the Poles were doing, just telling that the, the, the traitors should be killed. And during that meeting, during that meeting, it has been decided to kill Mr. Leakey. And Leakey was a head of the Jewish police at that time. After Sharinsky was taken by almost assassinated and taken by the Germans. And Lakin was a small bastard, as you can imagine. And then we cornered him. We cornered Lakin. Of course, I, I put my bullets into him, one or two bullets into him. Whether my bullets killed him or somebody else's bullets, I don't know. So we see here three responses. The first, if you kill yourself, if you're not. The second, try to get to the other side. Mm -hmm. And the third, fight. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sort of a new Jewish response. Mm -hmm. On January 18th, 1943, over 1,000 German, Lithuanian, and Latvian soldier, soldiers and militiamen marched into Ghetto and demanded 8,000 more Jews. This was after they took almost the 300,000. After they wanted 8,000 more. They wanted to, to assemble at the Umschlagplatz. That's where the Jews assembled, right? Most Jews disappeared into hiding places. The Germans launched a massive search and snatched every Jew they could find for deportation. As the Germans were leading a line of captured Jews to the train, a group of ZOB fighters, a youth group name, we'll see in a minute, opened fire on the Germans. With what? Pistols. Pistols against the machine. For the first time, in the history of the Warsaw Ghetto, the Germans encountered armed resistance. German forces retreated in confusion. Nevertheless, the action continued for four days. On January 21st, the action ended. Approximately 5,000 Jews were captured. Some Germans and most of the Jewish fighters were killed. That being said, bullets were ex exchanged. And the Nazis didn't know what to do because Fighting back was a human quality, and the Jew was not human. The Jew was an Untermensch, not a human being. So what? They didn't know what to do. What's happening? What was going on outside the ghetto? It was, what was the total picture? Mm -hmm. On the 2nd of February, 43, the Nazi 6th Army in Stalingrad, having exhausted their ammunition and food, Surrendered after five months, one week, and three days of fighting. Only 91,000 soldiers out of an army of 220,000 survived the battle. More than 50% were killed. Mm -hmm. Stalingrad was the largest defeat ever experienced by the German army. So the Na now what's happening was, right? The Nazis came into the ghetto, tried to pull people out. The Jews fought back. All of a sudden, word gets out, word gets back that the Nazis suffered a defeat. So the Jews are thinking, uh-oh, maybe something's changing here. The Nazis are defeated here. We, we got one. Maybe this is no longer a, a vada, or a, this is no longer a certain time of death. But maybe now it's a time game. Because if we can last out, maybe the, turn is, the, the, the tide is turning, right? All, what was introduced into this odd concoction Hope was there now, because from outside there was defeat, and inside there was defeat. Mm -hmm. And he wrote, and Mordechai Anilevich, he was a kid. <laughs> he, was, he was a kid. On January 22nd, 1943, six months will have elapsed since the start of the deportations of Warsaw. By this time they knew. 300,000 of our brothers and sisters were transported to and brutally murdered in the Treblinka death camp. We received reports left and right about Jews being killed. As we listen to these terrible tidings, we wait for our own time to come. 
Jewish masses, the hour is drawing near. You must be prepared to resist. Do not give yourself up like sheep to the slaughter. Our slogan must be, all are ready to die as human beings. Right? The Jewish Fighting Organization, a youth group, ZOB, it was the Zionist youth group. He's now made a poster. This was on it, calling people to stand up and fight. This is a very, very unique circumstance. Other ghettos also tried to revolt, but this is the only ghetto that was able to capture the imagination of the general populace and begin to elicit their involvement in one way or another. The head of the Bund, they didn't want to go to Israel. They wanted to stay in Poland and be good Polish citizens. We then decided that a joint battle organization should be formed and that its purpose should be to prepare armed resistance for the time when the Germans might attempt to repeat the extermination. They paused after the rebellion that saved three, eight, three of the 8,000 they wanted to take. But they knew it would start again. We realized that only through coordinated work, our utmost joint efforts could result in any and all and any at all to be expected. They hated each other, these groups. They didn't work together. They fought vociferally on every issue. But here they decided to come together. Right? He was the Bund. Here was Betar, Paul Franco. We're going to war. Adopt the slogan, rise up and fight. Do not despair of the chance for rescue. He who fights for his life has a chance of being saved. Find the courage to indulge in acts of madness. Put a stop to the degrading resignation expressed by such statements as we are all bound to die. It's a lie. We too are deserving a life. You merely must know how to fight for it. Right? He's Betar. He's, he's uh, Begin. Menachem Begin. Right? Who's Betar. Right? Bibi Netanyahu is Betar. Right? The, the Ru Rube, uh, Rabin, he was the Zionist group. Uh, Mordechai and Levin. Right? They're all students. They're all students of, of, of these European founders. And the Menachem Zemba, one of the great Orthodox leaders of the world at that time, he wrote, from the, he said, from the beginning, we should have used every opportunity and tactic to alert the conscience of the world. All we can do now is resist to the best of our abilities. We may not surrender ourselves voluntarily into enemy hands. All of a sudden, the Warsaw Ghetto was unified mm -hmm. under a call that we weren't going to simply surrender. From January 22nd to April 19th, deportations were halted from the Warsaw Ghetto because of this momentary fight back. But what happened? One can say without exaggeration, the entire population from the young to the old was engaged in preparing hiding places. Ghetto looked like an army camp. In the courtyards, one could see Jews carrying sandbags, bricks and lime. They worked day and night, especially industrious, were the bakers. Because bread was purchased in great quantities for the preparation of rusks. It was a way they, they dried out the bread, and they, they mixed it with water, and it became like crackers, and it lasted a long time. No one thought of willingly going to Treblinka. They knew what was in store, and they said, we're not doing it. The survivors prepared everything necessary for remaining in hiding for months. What did the Jews do? They are already to uh, build bunkers underneath. Because uh, I guess this was truly the end. And the deportations continued, and when we were on Buenos Aires, it was the first time that we heard about Treblinka, because you know people like to uh, fool themselves. None of us, I mean, I this goes for my parents and everyone. We just couldn't believe that indeed that were herding us, transporting us to, uh, as they call, Vernichtungslager. You know, the places where they are going to uh, gas us, to, you know, kill us off. Well, 
the only chance to survive is through a big bunker, big and camouflage in the way that no one can get yet one, two, three opening. And that was a mass action to start building bunkers, people uh, out of a block of apartments, people of uh, same kind, uh, you know, each other, families. So they started all digging and preparing some hiding part of a, a, a floor or something, some rooms so no one could see. And uh, of course, underground. Whoever had the possibility, the means, financial or otherwise, had friends, or, was trying to get to the Aryan side. I had, didn't have that possibility. I didn't have any money and I didn't have any friends on the Aryan side. And I was trying to get into the, the Jewish fighting organization where my friends that were working with me. So... You have three responses. Response number one is what? Hide. Hide. Same as before. Response number two, dig bunkers and also hide. And three was to escape or fight. Then, when the organization of the uprising started, my function was to go after curfew and paste the, uh, the posters calling uh, the Jews to armed rebellion on the walls of the buildings. Uh, my father, of course, was uh, beside. He didn't know what I was doing, but when I was coming home after the curfew, it was uh, it was a terrible thing. They were terribly, terribly worried. What was that like? How could you maneuver yourself before being caught? It was street wise. Uh, you know, there were patrols, but it was dark, and we knew the streets. And we're going through the valley, through the backyards. Uh, uh, you know, risking uh, our lives, but we were young. And uh, one was going with the bucket and the uh, uh, and the brush uh, to paste the wall, and the other one was running with the roll of posters and uh, flipping them. You know, it was uh, uh, it was fun. You know, it was. Uh, we were too young, I think, to realize how dangerous it really was. It was a kind of a sport. Um, oh, I, uh, I was adamant at uh, uh, the order of the day from Hashemera Sahir was that we are not going to be taken alive. You know, we are not going to be allowed to take on the transport. And I was all uh, uh, hyped up with it. I knew that this is exactly what I'm going to do. We are not going to go just like that. So uh, uh, there was just a conviction. We are just not going. It's the idealism of youth. I'm already an old man. I don't see such a romantic option in dying. <laughs> I'd rather live for the cause than die for it. But there we go. Air Pesach, that's why we're doing this program now. We're getting to that time of year. Mm. It was Passover Eve in 1942, and we arranged everything in the house in preparation for the holiday. We even had matzot, unleavened bread, everything. We had made the beds. The policeman who lived with us, who always told us everything what was going to happen, he told us, you should know that the ghetto is surrounded with Ukrainians. Tonight will not be a good night. He had, we had, he had heard this. We took all our belongings and went into the bunker. Why wait? So we took what we still had at home, whatever food we had, everything, and went down into the bunker and waited. Arab Pesa. Tuvia, or as Kowski writes, amidst this destruction, the table in the center of the room looked incongruous with glasses filled with wine, with the family seated around, the rabbi reading the Haggadah. His reading was punctuated 
by explosions and the rattling of machine guns. The faces of the family around the table were lit by the red light from the burning buildings nearby. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> On April 19th, Arab Pesach, at four in the morning, German soldiers crossed the Naweki intersection on the way to the central ghetto. Walking in an endless procession, behind them were tanks, armored vehicles, light cannons, and hundreds of Waffen-SS units on motorcycles. They look like they are going to war, I said to Tzipora, my companion in the post. Suddenly, I felt how very weak we were. What force did we have against an army, against tanks and armored vehicles? We had nothing but pistols and grenades. Simcha wrote, he survived. Now listen. Now, after the 22nd, and <clears throat> we knew what's going on, where they go, Peter Glimka to death, so Bye. Bye. But the Polish didn't want to sell us. The army, the Polish army, we paid for one revolver, three to five thousand dollars. For one bullet, ten dollars. Now, during the main so-called resettlement, there was a very complicated political situation in the Warsaw Ghetto. Because there were so many parties. And the, 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 the Zionists, the right and left and revisionists, they couldn't get together. But on the 28th, they formed, yeah, somehow, they came together and they formed 22 groups. They called, one was called GOB, the Jewish Fighting Organization, and the other one was called Irgun Zweile Umi. This was the revisionists, which were the followers of Jabotinsky. So what was the main thing now? Buy arms. Because they were, the COP had 700 people and Spy the only had 300. I could have thousands of young people. But there were no arms. The Polish government in London at the time sent us 50 revolvers with munition, 50 grenades and four kilograms of its blood. We bought 4,000 on the army side for money, 4,000 liters of gasoline. So when the tanks attacked, we burned it. Now, we trained the youngster. As I said, we were preparing ourselves to fight. So, <coughs> the, <clears throat> Underground, the 700 and 300, they were trained. But what? We didn't have any guns, any, uh, what do you call it, these? The guns, uh, so I, with sticks, eh? So bayonets and rifles. Rifles. We didn't have rifles. So they trained with sticks. So <clears throat> there was a bunker. In every building, there was a bunker. The people had to hit case of a new action, and there was a position assigned to every bunker. I was, I had 70 or 80 people in the bunker. <clears throat> assigned to my bunker, from my building. And, oh, I forget, it was the first night of Pesach, the first Seder. And before I tell you about this, we had spies, Jewish spies on the Aryan side. And the German knew that they won't get us out so simple. They left to fight. And they told us how they prepared the German, what they had against us. It's 2,000 SS soldiers. Listen to this. Three detachments of artillery. 1,000 of German police. 1,000 of Polish police. And 1,000 of Ukrainians. Lithuanians, Latvians, and Estonians in the black uniforms, the support of police. Against them, we were 700 in the Jewish fighting organization and 300 in the other 
but the Germans knew it would have lost their reason. And on the first seller, on April 19th, 1943, we get no cause from the other side, the Germans are surrounding the ghetto. So immediately, everybody went to the bunker to the Nia, some medicine, what medicine did I have? Aspirin and nothing else. <laughs> but then some material, you know, for them. And <coughs> all the soldiers went to the post. And on the 19th in the morning, I show you on the, my drawing there, to the Muranoska gate, next to the Ustadplatz, a platoon of German soldiers came to the Muranoska street, into the ghetto, and went to the Muranoska square, singing, you know, the northern people, the overmanship, supermanship, singing every now, when they came on the Manuska Street, there were two buildings there with flags. One Jewish flag, the Magdeburg, and one Polish flag. The boys, the Jewish boys knew that every bullet has to kill. Otherwise, they would come out. So when they stopped singing and standing there on the Moranaska Square, they came under fire. And it was hell for them because so many fell. They threw their guns and they ran away. Okay. Now every piece of arms, every revolver, every gun, every submachine gun were collected. That's how the <coughs> how the underground got submachine gun. There was not one one was only in the world yet. And uniforms, everything was collected. Two tanks went on Muranoska Street, on Zamenhofer Street, also from Muranoska Gate, on Zamenhofer Street, I showed you, to Mila Gate, and there they were waiting for them to time. They threw the Molotov cocktails on this and burned two times. Mm. So the Germans left, they were scared, they left the ghetto, and they knew they can't fight just on the open street. <coughs> So they sent planes, and the planes started to bombard. Okay. The greatest thing about this testimony is his face. Mm -hmm. His pride. Mm -hmm. He speaks mm -hmm. about it. He, 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 he was in concentration camp. He was and that's March, mm -hmm. and he survived. And look at him. He was a tough guy. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mordechai Anilevich wrote after this fight that we just heard about. It's impossible to put into words what we have been through. One thing is clear, what happened exceeded our boldest dreams. The Germans ran twice from the ghetto. One of our companies held out for 40 minutes, another for more than six hours. Several of our companies attacked the dispersing Germans. Our losses in manpower are minimal. That is also an achievement. I feel that great things are happening, and what we dare do is of great enormous importance. What we did what we need urgently, grenades, rifles, machine guns, and explosives. It is impossible to describe the conditions under which the Jews of the ghetto are now living. Only a few will be able to hold out. The remainder will die sooner or later. Their faith is decided. The fact that we are remembered beyond the ghetto walls encourages us in our struggle. Peace go with you, my friend. Perhaps we may still meet again. The dream of my life has risen to become a fact. Self-defense in the ghetto will have been a reality. Jewish armed resistance and revenge are facts. I have been a witness to the magnificent, heroic fighting of Jewish men in battle. It became the, the theme and the watchword of the Israeli army. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's, a, it's philosophically difficult. Sometimes it doesn't make sense. But you have to understand Jewish history. For us to go without putting up a fight is not imaginable anymore. And that's because of these young people, these idealistic young people who simply didn't know that the dream was absolutely completely impossible. Rabbi? Yes. He, oh, and Lavish also made another statement in that regard, in the sense that he said, 
maybe this will, I'm paraphrasing, this will be the beginning of another kind of Jew. Another thing he said to the group was, we don't have much of what we can control about our lives. We can't control our lives, but what we, what we can't control is how we die, and we can die for our Let's see one more interview. This is a, a different perspective, as he was a spy on the a Jewish spy on the Christian side. Oh. Now, after. <coughs> I was working in the States. And uh, the whole city was in flame. Because the whole city was burning. So many blacks, not one, so many blacks. And I looked at these blacks. But the worst thing for me was the Eastern Sunday. When I was in the church, listening to all the sermons of the priest, and I blend in with them together, and I came out, the priest was standing in the front, greeting all the parishioners, and they were dressed in their best clothing on Sunday. Most of them took their children to their, to their carousel, which was with music, which was around that. You could see with the naked eye what was going on in the ghetto, the flames and the burning, everything. And you were just listening to the expressions, Jews are burning, not burning. Jews are suspicious, marginal. Jews are frying. I was in that environment of the people. And to today, I cannot understand where did I take the strength not to scream, not to reveal who I am? That I look at my people burning, and I cannot say anything. And here the carousel is dry and running. The people are on the carousel with the parents happy. Yeah, he founded the gathering of survivors and the U.S. Holocaust Museum. Yes. Send me. Yes. <clears throat> Sorry. Jürgen Stroop was the Nazi in charge of it, and he right? Mm -hmm. Jewish court in Warsaw is no more May 16. What is this story? This is the story of will, desire, optimism, effort. It's the story that permeates the identity of every Jew today. The, die, the days where we'll take it seeding, seeding are over. But most importantly, it puts to rest a myth. And that myth mm -hmm. is that the Jews went like animal to the slaughter. We didn't. We fought. We fought spiritually. We had symphonies and schools and classes and religious services. And we fought physically, even though the, the, the cards were stacked against us in both places. And this is the anniversary we're going to celebrate, and I hope you'll mention it at your Passover Seder, the statement of Yitzchak Zuckerman. He said, I don't think there's any real need to analyze the uprising in military terms. This was a war of less than a thousand people against a mighty army, and no one doubted how it was likely to turn out. This isn't a subject for study in a military school. Not the weapons, not the operations, not the tactics. If there's a school to study the human spirit, there it should be a major subject. The really important things were inherent in the force shown by these Jewish youth. After years of degradation, to rise up against their destroyers and determine what death would choose, Treblinka or uprising. I don't know if there's a standard to measure that. That, ladies and gentlemen, is the story of the Russell.